We will begin today in John chapter 5, if you would start turning there. Today we're going to look at the enigmatic Azazel, the word used to describe the second goat in the Day of Atonement ceremony in Leviticus chapter 16. Now part of the reason for the mystery is that there is not a definition scripture for the word. The word is, Azazel is used only four times, all within the same chapter, and that's it. That's not a lot to go on. And because there is no definition scripture, we must start somewhere else to understand the Azazel and through it what God teaches us about atonement. But just as a faulty foundation endangers everything built on it, the starting point that we choose is critical because if we begin with a wrong premise, we cannot arrive at the correct conclusion. The Day of Atonement only comes around once a year, and depending on how fasting affects you personally, you may be a bit fuzzy-headed and maybe not thinking clearly. And then after Atonement, we're off to the feast, and the whole matter is all but forgotten until the next year. It's a subject that is easy not to give much thought to. For those who are curious, it's simple to look up the word Azazel in a Bible help and just accept what it says without evaluating whether it aligns with scripture. Others just go along with what they have heard or what their church teaches, and I was guilty of that. But very few take the trouble to blow the dust off their Bibles and do their own study beginning with God's word. Now here in John 5, Jesus provides a key principle that will help us in this. In John 5, in verse 31, he defends himself against accusations of blasphemy and Sabbath breaking. He says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now his statement may seem unusual because for us, what he says is the final word on any matter. He is the faithful and true witness. For us, his testimony outweighs absolutely everything. But the ESV suggests a word that helps to make his meaning clear. The ESV says, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. In other words, within this context, as a human, if his witness about himself were the only witness, it would not have been accepted by those who were accusing him. On a human level, Jesus acknowledges that something additional was required for even his own witness to be a valid testimony. Now the basis for Christ's statement is the law that he gave about establishing significant matters by the testimony of two or three witnesses. In the rest of John 5 then, down through verse 46, Christ provides additional witnesses of himself to prove that he is neither blaspheming nor guilty of violating the fourth commandment. And Jesus thus sets the pattern for us in establishing or judging critical matters. And this must be our approach when it comes to biblical teaching. We must find multiple witnesses of scripture to keep away from disputes over doubtful things as Romans 14 says. Jesus teaches that a single testimony is invalid. He says a couple of chapters later, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. An untested interpretation is the same as leaning on our own understanding or being wise in our own eyes. Sometimes pride or fear keep us from taking an honest look at a matter and allowing that we may be mistaken. And yet God says, on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. If we desire for God to look on us favorably, trembling at his word must be our overriding principle. Proverbs 28, 26 says bluntly, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. We must always seek witnesses of scripture to ensure that a teaching 
has more support than just human reasoning. Now, in addition to the law of using multiple witnesses, another time-tested law of Bible study is that we should not base a teaching on the meaning of a Greek or a Hebrew word. Now, one reason is that a given word can have multitudes of meanings depending on the context. Concordances are not menus that we pick from according to our preference or according to a conclusion that we desire. Now, another reason not to base a doctrine on the meaning of a word is that languages change over time, and modern Greek and Hebrew can differ significantly from biblical Greek and Hebrew. The exact meaning of a word in ancient times is not always certain, and therefore, more is required than looking up a word in a concordance or other study aid. Lexicons and Bible dictionaries certainly can help, but they are just that. They are a help, not a solid base. They certainly have their place, but their definitions must be tufted against biblical usage. Now, if you've been in the church for any length of time, you've probably observed that resting a teaching on the meaning of a word leads to arguments about words, which Paul warns against. Instead of meaningful discussions about the whole counsel of God, this approach encourages heaping up teachers, such as scholars or reference works that agree with the specific point of view. And yet this is very dangerous because you can find support among scholars for just about any perspective, even ones that are anti-God. But the most important reason not to base a doctrine on the definition of a word is that the definition only constitutes a single witness. Such a solitary testimony is not valid as Jesus himself establishes. A solid foundation consists of multiple witnesses that do not contradict the rest of the word of God. Now we will be spending some time considering the most common starting places, the beginnings that you have encountered or you will encounter if you study into the Azazel. These are the foundations upon which interpretations are built, so we need to evaluate their trustworthiness. And I will tell you up front, not one of them is certain, which is the reason that there's disagreement over the word Azazel. Some of these beginnings are a bit technical, and if that isn't your cup of tea, that's okay. We won't spend too much time on the technical ones. But taken together, they illustrate why it is unwise to base a doctrine on any solitary witness. Now, the central issue is not which starting point makes the most sense to us, but which has the most support, if any, from the rest of Scripture. And one starting point comes from separating the word azazel into two Hebrew word, roots. The first root is azaz, that's apostrophe A-Z, A-Z, Strong's number 5810. It means to strengthen or to prevail. The second root is the well-known Hebrew word El. Strong's 410 and El is a title of God. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says combining these roots will give Azazel a meaning of the strength of God. However, the difficulty with this starting point is that it does not clearly relate to what happens within the chapter and particularly the second goat. Now, just to give you an idea of the ambiguity of the Hebrew, other scholars use the very same roots to suggest that Azazel means a powerful God, but with a lowercase g, meaning a demon. And this is because on rare occasion, El is used for a God other than the true one. And so the exact same roots are used, but they lead to very different interpretations. A second starting point is that Azazel is the name of a place, and specifically a location east of Jerusalem. Now, this interpretation comes from rabbinic Judaism, which developed in the centuries after the Jews returned from Babylon. In this view, Azazel describes a particularly hard and difficult land 
to which the second goat was taken with all the sins of the nation. And in later practice, many centuries after God gave these instructions, the second goat was brought to a cliff and it was pushed over the cliff backwards for some strange reason. Now certainly the Jews have added to God's word here because those actions are not part of his instructions. This interpretation focuses on a specific accursed location to which the goat takes the sins. In modern Hebrew, there is a phrase, Lake La Azazel, which means go to Azazel. Now parents, cover your kids' ears because it's the Hebrew equivalent of saying go to hell. So in this starting point, Azazel is a bad place. A basic problem with this idea is that Leviticus 16 was given while Israel was in the wilderness and their camp location always changed. God did not record that Israel always camped in the same place for the Day of Atonement, nor stopped each year within walking distance of the same cliff. This starting point derives a meaning based on a practice that developed a thousand years after Leviticus was written, and then it applies it retroactively. And in addition, this interpretation puts the focus on a specific location, and yet the instructions in the chapter as a whole focus on how God removes the sins of the nation and not where the sins end up. All right, a third starting point also comes from separating Azazel into two different roots. The first root is Ez, that's apostrophe EZ, Strong's number 5795, which means goat. The second root is Azal, apostrophe A-Z-A-L, Strong's number 235, and it means to go away. Putting these together, Strong's concordance defines Azazel as goat of departure. The theological word book of the Old Testament says a possible meaning is the goat of entire removal. And the expository dictionary of biblical words renders it as the goat for complete sending away. So this starting point at least fits with what happens to the second goat. And yet it has its detractors as well. Some scholars are not certain that the first root, the word for goat, is correct. I don't know. Now there is a related interpretation some suggest that the word azazel is a reduplication, meaning a doubling up or a repetition of the word azal, which is the word for going away. These scholars propose that the original word was azalzel, which is a repetition of azal, and it was then shortened to azazel. But because the same word is repeated, it has the implication of removal, removal. And this is why the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon says Azazel means entire removal. And looked at in this way, the word Azazel is abstract, describing a function rather than an animal or a personality. The repetition of the word indicates a series of acts that produces the result, and thus the complete removal comes from a certain procedure. So instead of Azazel meaning the goat of departure, it would simply mean the complete removal. It's more of a title. Now the Septuagint provides some support for this starting point. The Septuagint was written two to three centuries before Christ and it's often quoted in the New Testament. In its translation of the Hebrew word Azazel, it uses the word apopompeos, which simply means sent out. The translators of the Septuagint did not interpret Azazel to mean Satan, but instead rendered it with the idea of removal or sending away. Okay, a fourth starting point for understanding the Azazel is also technical, but it is worth being aware of. This approach likewise comes from separating the word Azazel into roots, but the roots themselves are interpreted at the beginning through a negative lens. This interpretation begins with the assumption that the Azazel must be bad simply because the Azazel is not the first goat, which everyone agrees was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. So this 
beginning also uses the root as all, that's Strong's 235, which as I mentioned is a verb that means removal, going away, or being sent away. Now it combines that with the word as, apostrophe AZ, and that's Strong's 5794. It's an adjective with the basic meaning of strong. It's translated as fierce, greedy, mighty, powerful, and rough. And from these two words, the following meaning is derived. The strong and obstinate one who is destined to go away and disappear. Now, according to those who interpret Azazel this way, it is a highly derogatory and offensive name describing terribly bad character. But this starting point has a significant problem of bias. It's an example of picking from a menu of meanings according to one's taste. And that is, while the word can describe negative aspects of character, such as fierceness, it also describes many things that are morally neutral, such as the sea, wind, ants, and even a lion. And significantly, its first usage is in Genesis 49.3, in the, in the blessing there, where Jacob describes Reuben as, quote, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. And though Reuben had his problems, Jacob uses the word here as praise. And so the basic problem with this interpretation is that any number of people, animals, and environmental forces have strength or power. They do not all have fierceness or bad character. In other words, as essentially describes strength, but this starting point concludes that the strength is negative and thus can only mean Satan. Now the root of as is another word that I mentioned before, azaz, which means to be strong, prevail, make firm, or strengthen. It describes unrighteous people twice, but it also portrays God's actions in numerous places, as well as wisdom. The act of strengthening is neutral. The wicked do it, but so do the righteous, including God himself. And so this starting point chooses a meaning based on a conclusion because the roots themselves have multiple meanings. Now, some scholars suggest that Azazel is a name because compound nouns are frequently used as proper nouns. Azazel appears to be a compound noun, and thus it could be a name, but it's not definitive. In English, it's easy to recognize proper nouns because they begin with a capital letter, but in Hebrew, only the context or the meaning will identify proper nouns. So the question is, if Azazel is a name, whom does it identify? Well, consider this. You're probably aware that the word Satan means adversary. That describes the devil's primary role. However, the first two times that the word Satan is used, it does not describe the devil, but rather God, who calls himself the adversary of the wicked. That's in Numbers 22. And so even if the word Azazel is a proper noun, more biblical support is required before we conclude that it's the name of a demon. Now, those of you who are older in the faith are familiar with the Moffat translation. It was a favorite of some within the worldwide church of God. Well, Moffat makes a great leap in Leviticus 16 because he renders the word Azazel as Azazel the demon. This is not a translation, but a risky addition an assumption because the Hebrew in the chapter makes no mention of demons. And yet that idea is reinforced every time Moffat's rendering of Leviticus 16 is read. Now the fifth and final starting point for interpreting the word Azazel is the one we are most familiar with. It isn't technical, but rather the tradition that the Azazel is a type of Satan. And this is the starting point used by the Seventh-day Adventists and the Worldwide Church of God. We will spend the most time on this one because it has many aspects that need to be examined. Now, my intent in all of this is not to disparage any servant 
of God. Even so, in the course of proving all things, some things have come to light, which, while they might make us uncomfortable, we need to look at squarely and evaluate honestly if we are going to hold fast to truth. The eminent Seventh-day Adventist scholar J.N. Andrews, in his book, The Judgment, Its Event, Events, and Their Order, uses the following to support the teaching that the Azazel is a type of Satan. Quoting, another confirmation is found in the book of Enoch, where the name Azazel is given to one of the fallen angels, thus plainly showing what was the prevalent understanding of the Jews at that day. And that day was in the two or three centuries before Christ. Still another evidence is found in the Arabic, where Azazel is employed as the name of the evil spirit. In addition to these, we have the evidence of the Jewish work Zohar and of the Kabbalistic and rabbinical writers. They tell us that the following proverb was current among the Jews. This is the proverb. On the day of atonement, a gift to Samael. Samael is a name for Satan in Jewish folklore. That's the end of the quote. Now notice that scripture is entirely missing from these supports. Instead, what have leaned upon is Arabic tradition, rabbinical interpretation, and even Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism. None of these are even good supports, let alone a foundation for a doctrine. Now we'll return to Adventist teaching later because it plays a larger part in this subject than many realize. Now the Worldwide Church of God likewise leaned heavily on tradition in its teaching on the Azazel. I encourage you to take a fresh look at the materials that I will mention and really analyze the starting points that are used, whether the teaching about the Azazel begins with scripture or whether the identification of the Azazel is based on tradition and scholarly interpretation. Now, if the scholars can make their case from scripture, then they can be quite helpful. But if their explanations are scripture free, they are really just the opinions of mere men. The original Ambassador College Correspondence Course, published in 1965, teaches that Azazel is the name of a demon based on, it says, ancient Jewish literature and apocryphal literature. And for those who may not be aware, apocryphal means of doubtful authenticity. It is a writing that is sketchy, not something to use as a primary source. Now the updated 1986 edition of the correspondence course uses more sources to explain Azazel, but not scriptures. It first draws on Arabic tradition, quoting the Hebrew Chaldee lexicon as saying, Quote, this name was used for that of an evil demon. The name Azazel is also used by the Arabs as that of an evil demon. And we'll return to Arab tradition a little bit later. The correspondence course then quotes from a book entitled Islam and its founder to establish that, quote, the devil named Iblis in the Quran was once one of the archangels in heaven and was called Azazel, but by disobedience fell, end quote. Now take a moment and let that sink in. Not the quote, but the fact that Islam is being used for establishing biblical doctrine. <clears throat> Islam's beginning tells us of its own credibility problem. I'll give you the quick version. This is a summary of the story told in two books, one by Karen Armstrong called Muhammad and the other by Alfred Ghulam called Life of Muhammad. Now, according to these authors, Islamic history holds that Muhammad received the contents of the Quran from Allah, the moon God. But first, Muhammad had to be put into the proper frame of mind by a spirit calling himself Gabriel who bears no resemblance to the Gabriel of the Bible. Muhammad was asleep 
in a mountain cave when he was suddenly awakened and overwhelmed by a devastating spiritual presence. He recounted later that Gabriel, and I'm putting that in quotes, enveloped him in a terrifying embrace and Muhammad felt like his breath was being forced from his body. Gabriel then commanded Muhammad to recite what was flooding into his mind. And after Gabriel strangled Muhammad two more times, such that he felt he could not endure any longer, Muhammad started involuntarily speaking what became the Quran. Muhammad wrote later that when this happened, he believed he had been possessed, if you can imagine. He was so terrified at the thought of falling under a demonic influence that he intended to throw himself off the mountain to kill himself. But he was reassured by the strangling Gabriel that he had been chosen to be Allah's apostle and then it was all okay. Now scripture never depicts the angels of the true God acting this way. And yet this obviously demonic activity was the critical genesis of Islam and its sacred book. If this Gabriel is indicative of the Islamic concept of a good spirit being, we certainly cannot give that tradition any credence for identifying the natures of spirit beings. And so even though the Quran states that the, e that the devil was once named Azazel, the Quran and Islamic tradition are simply not reliable witnesses for understanding what is in the Bible. God does not leave us without the means to understand his word, such that we should look to that tradition. Now, this is a side note, but I, I think it's quite striking. If you compare Islamic prophecy of the end times with biblical prophecy of the end times, you will find that they mirror each other. And that is the prophecies contain very similar accounts of end time events, but the good guys and the bad guys are exactly opposite in each perspective, just like in a mirror. The descriptions of the heroes that over 1 billion Muslims are waiting for match the descriptions of the beast and the false prophet in Revelation. And the enemies of Allah depicted in Islamic prophecy match God's people in biblical prophecy. They are completely opposite. And so again, this is not a clean source for identifying a key element of one of God's holy days. Now the correspondence course's primary support is a Jewish commentary called the Torah, a modern commentary. It says, Azazel was probably a demonic being apocryphal Jewish works composed in the last few centuries before the Christian era tell of angels who were lured into rebellion against God. These mythological stories, which must have been widely known, seem to confirm the essentially demonic nature of the old biblical Azazel." End quote. Apocryphal Jewish works composed in the last few centuries before the Christian era clearly refers to the book of Enoch. However, in the book of Enoch, Azazel is not the devil. Now that should give us pause as well because the very sources the correspondence course uses are contradictory on a significant point. That is, in the Quran, the devil was called Azazel but in the book of Enoch, Azazel isn't even Satan. He's one of his minions. Now, what sort of structure can possibly be built on such an unsteady foundation? And yet the book of Enoch is not part of the Bible. Like with the Quran, we have no need of it to understand one of God's holy days. Leviticus 16 was written long before all of these traditions developed, which means that we need to start there not with the ideas of carnal men that came a millennium later or two millennia in the case of the Quran. In Titus 1 verse 14, Paul specifically warns against giving heed to Jewish myths and fables and the apocryphal Jewish works that the correspondence course uses as proof 
certainly fit that description and warning. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that scripture is profitable for doctrine. Extra biblical fantasy is not. Mythical stories have no validity as a starting point for understanding what God teaches about the Day of Atonement. Now, some Bible students distance themselves from the apocryphal works, and rightly so, but they still note that both the Jews and the Arabs have long-standing traditions of a spirit that lived in the wilderness. And there could be a germ of truth here, but it may not lend the support expected. The Bible records that the Israelites did interact with a spirit being in the wilderness. That part is quite true. That spirit being led them and provided them for them for 40 years through an area that many would consider to be cursed. The surrounding nations, which included the Edomites and the Ishmaelites, later the Arabs, were well aware of the Israelites as they were led by this spirit being. But was that spirit in the wilderness evil or good? Was he malignant or benevolent? Well, consider the perspectives of those handing down these traditions. The Arab perspective is self-evident. The Arabs as a people have never worshiped the true God. They do not yet have eyes to recognize him. They saw Israel and Israel's fearsome God as evil. Arab tradition that a spirit in the wilderness was evil is not a reliable witness and could easily argue for the reverse given that the carnal mind looks on what is godly as evil. Something similar can be said for quite a few of the traditions handed down by the Jews. Certainly not all traditions are problematic. The Fiddler on the Roof movie portrays well how tradition can keep a community together and be a positive thing. But not all traditions are reliable and good. We must evaluate each one and discard any that contradict the word of God. In this case, the spirit being who led the Israelites in the wilderness was not evil. He only seemed so in the minds of those who were carnal, which was most of them. Remember, the Israelites carried idols with them throughout their time in the wilderness. You can find that in Amos 5 and Acts 7. Their idols seemed good to them, but the true God did not. God's way of life undoubtedly seemed devilish. It was chafing and constraining, which is one reason that they always complained. They did not see the true God as a force for good in their lives. They believed he was bent on their destruction. It says that in Deuteronomy 1. Joshua rebuked Israel because, as he said, serving the true God seemed evil to them. The Israelites accepted Baal, Molech, and other demons, and yet, as Stephen told the council during his trial, the fathers always resisted the Holy Spirit. Isaiah castigated ancient Judah for calling evil good and good evil, for putting darkness for light and light for darkness. Their backwards judgment was still on display during Christ's ministry which is why he denounced their traditions that interfered with true worship. The Jewish leadership considered the son of God to be evil and they put to death their own Messiah. If they were unable to identify God in the flesh when he walked among them, how trustworthy is their folklore and their mythology about a spirit being in the wilderness? Now there's one more piece of literature that we will consider. And maybe this seems like it is belaboring the points, but it is important that we have all of the information so that we can test whether these starting points are solid enough to support a major teaching. For those of you who like detective stories, we will call this the curious case of the comprehensive commentary. <laughs> this mystery be begins in a booklet that most of us are well familiar with called Pagan Holidays or God's Holy Days, which it discusses the pagan origins of things like Christmas and Easter, and then it briefly explains the significance 
of God's true holy days. Now, when the booklet gets to the Day of Atonement in chapter 3, like the correspondence course, it does not use a foundation of scripture, and that should be a red flag. Instead, the booklet begins its explanation of the Azazel with two commentaries. It uses the opinions of scholars, which certainly can be helpful, yet only if they give clarity that is scripture-based. But the commentaries used in the booklet do not have any support from scripture. Now we'll focus on the first commentary. The booklet says this, the comprehensive commentary has Spencer, after the oldest opinions of the Hebrews and Christians, thinks Azazel is the name of the devil, and so Rosen. The word scapegoat signifies the goat which went away, end quote. So the booklet begins with the meaning of a Hebrew word as explained by commentators. But this first reference is curious because the comprehensive commentary is really pretty obscure. The same quote is used in the correspondence course in one of, one of the early editions, but otherwise the comprehensive commentary is not used in any other worldwide Church of God literature, at least none that I could find. It doesn't appear to have been sitting on a shelf somewhere at headquarters as a go-to reference work. Also puzzling is the fact that this short excerpt is entirely unremarkable. It contains no exposition of scripture, nor any sort of clear or powerful or persuading discussion. It is simply the opinions of men about whom we know very little and one of whose names is misspelled. So why was that excerpt chosen to make the case that the Azazel was a type of Satan? Now, if you do some internet detective work, you will find that very same quote from the comprehensive commentary used in a few other places. Think back to the excerpt that I gave you from the book called The Judgments, Its Events in Their Order by Adventist scholar J.N. Andrews. Well, just after Mr. Andrews says that further support for identifying the Azazel comes from the Book of Enoch and from Arabic tradition, rabbinical interpretation, and Jewish mysticism, he uses this same quote from the comprehensive commentary. However, Mr. Andrews gets the names of both scholars right, and he also includes a line about a differing opinion that the booklet leaves out. Now, Mr. Andrews' book was published in 1890, but there is an even earlier use of that same quotation. It's found in an article titled, The Law of Moses. It was published in an Adventist newsletter called the Day Star Extra in 1846. The article was authored by a man named O.R.L. Crozier. That name is not familiar to most of us, if any of us, but Mr. Crozier is noteworthy because he was the architect of the Adventist understanding of the Azazel as Satan. Now, Mr. Crozier's unique contribution was to interpret Leviticus 16 according to sequence. Now, I don't want to get bogged down with Mr. Crozier, but you'll see why this matters in a moment. He was the first one to use the quote from the comprehensive commentary. Now, after that, he then stated that the Azazel could not represent Christ because of the order of the symbols within Leviticus 16 as compared to Christ's death and resurrection. In his view, the first goat is a type of the crucified Christ. The high priest entering the Holy of Holies is a type of the resurrected Christ. And therefore, Mr. Crozier deduces that the Azazel could only be fulfilled by someone other than Christ and after Christ's resurrection. For Mr. Crozier, the key was in the symbolic sequence. And if you're interested, you can find this on the Ellen G. White Estate website at whiteestate.org. Now, one difficulty with this view is that it is highly selective. Mr. Crozier chose to focus on just three elements within this long chapter. If he had tried to interpret all of the elements in the chapter according to their sequence of their later fulfillment, his mind would have exploded because it cannot be done. <laughs> 
The chapter contains more than two sacrificial animals, and the high priest does much more than just enter the Holy of Holies. But Mr. Crozier chose just a slice of the chapter on which to build his interpretation, and he ignored everything else. Now, to bring this full circle, we'll get back to the Pagan Holidays booklet. After the booklet uses the unremarkable comprehensive commentary quote and another commentary as a starting point, it then uses the very same sequential explanation as Mr. Crozier. It says the slain goat represents the crucified Christ. The high priest represents the resurrected Christ and therefore the Azazel must represent something else. The booklet uses the same obscure commentary and the same basic reasoning as Mr. Crozier. Now you can draw your own conclusions as far to how or how to connect these dots. But for my part, it is hard to shake the impression that the worldwide Church of God borrowed from the Seventh-day Adventist teaching in this particular matter. There is an ironic epilogue to the curious case of the Comprehensive Commentary. And incidentally, the full title is The Comprehensive Commentary on the Holy Bible. It was copyrighted in 1837 and edited by William Jenks. Mr. Crozier used an abbreviated title in his articles and everyone else have just copied it, not knowing that it was abbreviated. Now you can find digital scans of it on the University of Michigan website. And those scans reveal something noteworthy. In the section that keeps on being quoted, the commentary simply notes what various scholars think. It just gives a variety of viewpoints. But when you get to the commentary's own explanation of what the Azazel represents, it lays out a compelling case from scripture that the Azazel points to Jesus Christ's work. The section that keeps on being quoted is just a listing of opinions, while the meat of the commentary argues against the view, Mr. Crozier and, and Mr. Andrews, and it does so with scripture. Now I know that was a lot to wade through, but I think you can see that it was necessary for really evaluating where to begin or where not to begin. The overall point is that the meaning of the Hebrew word Azazel is ambiguous, and we've seen some of the confusion surrounding it. We've examined the most common beginnings, some of which are reasonable, others are doubtful, if not demonic. But none of them has two, let alone three, witnesses of scripture that would qualify it to be used as a solid foundation. They are simply assertions and possibilities. Now regarding the traditional view, please consider that if the Day of Atonement can only be understood by using apocryphal works, Arabic tradition, and Jewish folklore and mythology, or through the scholars who lean on such sources, perhaps there is a larger conversation that the body of Christ needs to have about what our trusted source of truth really is. We need a foundation of scripture upon which to build an understanding of Leviticus 16. There's no need to rely on tradition or deduction because God has already given the interpretation. What remains for us is to search it out like buried treasure. If we do not allow scripture to interpret itself, any other explanation, no matter how dogmatically declared, is so much sound and fury signifying nothing. And John Reitenbaugh's keynote sermon, Do You See God? Several times he states a basic law of human behavior. He says, we see what we want to see. We see what we expect to see. We see what we are educated to see. And in this way, if a man reads Leviticus 16 with the expectation that Satan must be found there, that man will find him somehow. The man will interpret the objects, the events, and meanings of Hebrew words according to his expectation. If he grew up hearing that Azazel is the name of a demon 
as I did, he will read Leviticus 16 with that education and that expectation. Something extraordinary must occur for it to dawn on him that his perspective of the Azazel lacks a biblical foundation. Now please start turning to Leviticus 16. Now since there is no definition in scripture for Azazel and disagreement among scholars over the meaning of the word, where else can we possibly begin? Well, another principle of Bible study that we have been taught is to begin with clear scriptures to establish a foundation before going to the verses that are less clear. And so, setting aside the uncertainty surrounding the word as Azul, we will start with the clearest and the simplest scriptures possible. We will start with actions. Here in Leviticus 16, we'll read verses 21 and 22. It says, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Okay, these verses show the live goat involved in two basic actions. Number one, all the iniquities, transgressions, and sins of the people, and that's critical, are laid on its head. And number two, the live goat bears all these sins into the wilderness away from the tabernacle. Now, these are not minor details. These actions describe the primary role of the second goat. Their fulfillments should be easily found within God's word, and indeed they are. These two identifying actions are found in the Messianic prophecy in Isaiah 53. If you'd please turn there. Isaiah 53, we'll start reading in verse four. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. It carries the implication of cursing. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Verse six. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the eternal has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So verse six gives a clear fulfillment of Leviticus 16, 21. The eternal laid our iniquities on the Messiah, just as the high priest laid his hands on the Azazel and confessed over it all the iniquities of the people. Now, in general, the laying on of hands indicates a solemn identification, a testimony, or a setting apart. And it frequently contains the idea of transference. In the sin offering, the laying on of hands symbolizes the identification of an innocent substitute to whom sin is transferred from the guilty party. The hands also identify who is to bear the sin. Now the live goat was a substitute. It was not guilty, nor was it being blamed for sin. Instead, the sins of the nation were symbolically transferred to it and it bore them away from God's presence in the tabernacle. The purpose of a substitutionary sacrifice is to have an innocent representative standing in the place of the person or group so the guilty party does not have to bear the sins. The animal stands in for the sinner or sinners. The Azazel was the type in receiving the sins of the nation and the Messiah was the anti-type in receiving our sins. Now in verse four, the Messiah is prophesied to bear our griefs and sorrows 
which are not the sins themselves, but which are the effects of sin. Verses 4 and 5 portray the trauma the Messiah would undergo. They foretell that the Messiah would do more than just die. If God only required death for his justice to be satisfied, he could have had the Romans cut Christ's throat, just like an animal's. One quick and deadly slice, and it would be over. And yet Isaiah foretells that the Messiah would undergo incredible suffering before dying. And there is a potent lesson here, which is that sin incurs much more than just the death penalty. Sin also causes physical and emotional pain. It causes grief and sorrow. It causes separation between people and more critical between mankind and God, beginning with mankind's expulsion from God's presence in the Garden of Eden. Now, there's much that could be said about the rotten fruit that sin produces, but for our purposes, it's enough to recognize that when God laid our iniquities on the Messiah, that action caused more than death. It caused unparalleled agony and disfigurement. Isaiah 40, uh, 52, 14, back just a few verses. It says that Christ was marred more than any man, such that it was hard to tell that he was even human. That's what sin does. It distorts and corrupts the image in which mankind was created. We were created in God's image, but sin destroys that likeness. Or we'll continue in verse 11. Isaiah 53, 11 and 12. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. These verses contain two references to the second function prefigured in the Azazel and performed by the Messiah, that of bearing sin. As it says in Leviticus 16.22, the Azazel was to bear on itself all the iniquities of the people. Its primary role was bearing sins as a substitute. Verse 11 here teaches that justification results from the Messiah bearing iniquities. And verse 12 uses the prophetic past tense, saying that the Messiah bore the sins of many. When this prophecy was given, his work was as good as done. Now here are two more clear scriptures about Christ that directly link to the role of the Azazel. We're already on our third witness of a messianic fulfillment of the Azazel. Please start turning to Hebrews chapter 9. The book of Hebrews has been described of the Leviticus of the New Testament. A main purpose of Hebrews was to help the church, and particularly those of a Jewish background, to understand the scriptures through the lens of Christ's life, death, and high priesthood. Hebrews chapter 9 contains the New Testament explanation of the Day of Atonement. If there were a confirmation that sins will be laid either on the head of Satan or on one of his minions, depending on your choice, and that he will bear them, there could hardly be a more fitting place to make note of this than Hebrews 9. But the author of Hebrews does not even hint at Satan's involvement with atonement in any way. Instead, the flow of the chapter reinforces Christ's fulfillment of the day of atonement at every point. Hebrews 9, verses 20 through, 22 through 25, describe the purifying of the holy place, which is what the first goat accomplished. No sins were confessed on that first goat. And so its blood allowed entrance into the Holy of Holies, even as Jesus entered the heavenly 
holy of holies with his own pure blood. And next, in the Leviticus 16 ritual, the Azazel bore the sins of Israel. In the parallel, in Hebrews, the author subsequently declares who bore our sins. Hebrews 9, verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. This is basically the New Testament commentary on Leviticus 16, and it points us to Jesus Christ, not to Satan or a lesser demon called Azazel. Now the Apostle Peter provides yet another solid witness that like the Azazel, Jesus bore our sins. First Peter chapter two, if you turn over a few pages. First Peter two and verse 24. Peter writes, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Notice that the exact terms and functions used to describe the live goat are later applied to Jesus as the Messiah. Now Christ fulfilled the first goat as well, but the first goat did not bear any sins. The bearing of sins was specific to the second goat. Now Peter tells us how and when Christ bore our sins. He bore them in his own body while he was on the tree. His bearing of sin was not simply a legal pronouncement. It had a real life application and a recorded fulfillment. The bearing took place during his extreme suffering, which he endured for hours while he took on the shame, the reproach, the anguish, piercing, crushing, bruising, smiting, grief, separation, disfigurement, and all the other effects of sin. Now, we may not like to think about what happens to Christ when our sins were laid on him, but without admitting a specific sac facet of his sacrifice, we miss the foundational reason for his taking on human flesh. Now, we understand that Jesus bore our sins and their penalty, but what can be harder to accept is that Paul says that Christ became sin. We'll see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you please turn there. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. Paul writes, for he, that's the father, made him who knew no sin, that's Christ, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now Paul words, Paul's words may be startling and uncomfortable, but they are true. God the father made Christ to be sin. Now this doesn't mean that God made him commit sin. His life and his nature were entirely flawless, but it says God made him to be sin. Now the instructions for sin offerings contain a detail that helps us to understand why Paul could make this statement. An interlinear Bible shows that in almost every verse in the Old Testament where a sin offering is mentioned, the word offering is supplied by the translators. The word offering is not present in the Hebrew. And this is because the word for sin offering, that's the word kata'a, I'll spell that, C-H-A-T-T-A apostrophe A-H, this is Strong's 2403. The word for sin offering is also the word for sin. The word has multiple meanings. It can indicate sin, a sin offering, guilt because of sin, purification from sin, or punishment because of sin. The same word is used to signify all of those things, and you have to look at the context to know what it means. Now, in a sin offering, the animal became symbolic of the guilt incurred by the sin. It suffered punishment because of sin, and it was also the symbolic purification from sin 
And this is why the same word is used for both sin and sin offering. The animal, the substitute, essentially became the sin needing to be atoned. When the high priest laid all the iniquities of Israel on the Azazel, that second goat became sin. Now, one translation tries to soften what's said here by saying that God made Christ to be the offering for our sin. And that is true, but that's not faithful to the text. The Greek word for sin here is not like the Hebrew word. In the Greek, sin simply means sin. When a sin offering is indicated, another Greek word must be included. But here Paul means just what we read. God made Christ to be sin. Truly, the role of the Azazel was a dreadful one, but it was part of the work that only the Messiah could do and which he had to do for there to be reconciliation with God. Now, there is another commonality between the Azazel and the Messiah that is not immediately apparent when reading Leviticus 16, but it's important that we see this. Now, I'll read something from a study paper that crossed my desk a few years back. I don't agree with all the paper, but this excerpt brings out a key symbol that further identifies who the Azazel prefigures. All right, quoting, when all the sins are placed on the head of the goat for Azazel, then that amounts to a curse being placed on the individual, on the individual who is represented by the goat for Azazel. The individual who is represented by that goat is clearly being cursed. And when that goat is then led into the wilderness, that too is a curse. It is a curse to be sent into the wilderness. The goat for Azazel is clearly cursed." End quote. So the Azazel became cursed, not only through having sins laid on it, but also through being sent away from the holy place. Being sent outside the camp symbolized divine rejection. Symbolically, one was separated from fellowship with the source of life and all good, which is certainly a curse. Sin entered the world through Adam, says that in Romans 5.12, and he was sent away from the Garden of Eden, away from God's holy presence. Now, Paul says that this is what happened with Jesus Christ. Please turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3 and verse 13. Paul says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now Paul bases his statement on Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, which says, he who is hanged is accursed of God. Those instructions uh, concern the requirements to bury a hanged man on the same day as his execution because he has been cursed by God. To leave an accursed thing hanging would defile the land. Now Paul applied this to Jesus Christ, recognizing that because Jesus was hanged on a tree, he was cursed. Think about him crying out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, he knew why. He became a curse, not because of something he had done, but because of what we have done. So this refers to Christ on the tree, which is when and where he bore our sins, as we saw. The Father laid on Christ the iniquity of us all, just as the high priest laid the iniquities of Israel on the Azazel. And Paul says Jesus became a curse. He does not say that Jesus is accursed in the present because the curse of the law was fulfilled when Christ died. He was then raised up, and the next time he appears, it will be apart from sin, as we saw, apart from what he took on and became. In the present, he is certainly blessed. And yet Paul declares that Christ became a curse for us. He fulfilled the awful, shameful role 
of the Azazel as only he could. Now we've seen when and how Christ bore our sins and now we will look at where. The instructions for the regular sin offering specified that the animal had to be killed at the tabernacle. Their carcasses were then burned outside the camp, but their deaths took place at the tabernacle or the later temple. The exception was the Azazel. Now the fact that the priest left the Azazel alive does not preclude it from being a sin offering. The life of the Azazel was most certainly dedicated and consumed by its role of becoming sin, becoming cursed, and acting as a purification from sin. All of that fits within the meaning of kata'a, that word for sin offering that has a wide variety of uses. The life of the Azazel did not end at the Azazel, at the tabernacle, excuse me. Instead, it was sent or led outside the camp, away from God's presence, while bearing the sins of the nation. Now, where did Christ bear our sins? Hebrews 13, 12 says that he suffered outside the gate. The standard sin offerings were all killed at the tabernacle or, or temple, but Jesus suffered outside the gate. The most likely place for Christ's crucifixion was across the Kidron Valley on a slope of the Mount of Olives. Christ's crucifixion was at a place where the centurion who was guarding him could see the temple veil, which faced east, and he could see that it was torn from top to bottom. To be able to see that required that the centurion have a specific angle and a minimum elevation in order to see over the temple wall. Now, I will refer you to John's sermon entitled, Eat in the Garden and the Two Trees, Part 3. But the point is that Jesus did not suffer at the temple where the sin offerings had to be killed. The gospels say he was led away and he was sent from the temple, from the symbolic presence of God, just like the Azazel. The second Adam was led and sent away to fulfill the curse on the first Adam so that we can now come back into God's presence. That was part of the curse that he took on our behalf. Like the second goat, Christ's sacrifice was not an immediate death. He was alive while he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Christ's bearing of our sins took hours and he felt every second. He became sin and a curse as he hung there, bearing our transgressions outside the gate. Now let's consider where the Jewish tradition that the Azazel was a demonic being may have originated. This is speculative, but just try it on for size. As we've seen through the laying on of hands and having sins confessed over it, the Azazel became a representation of all of the sins, iniquities, and transgressions of the nation. Now, as Jewish thought developed over time, this cursed representative may have come to signify evil itself in the minds of those far from God. And that is, instead of being seen as a substitute that was chosen for that role, the, the Azazel may have come to be seen as something evil from the beginning that needed to be identified and blamed to bring about atonement because human nature is eager to redirect the blame. While the exact meaning of the word Azazel is not certain, it clearly refers to a role that is detestable. It is but a small step in an active and carnal imagination, such as possessed by the writers of the Book of Enoch, to arrive at Azazel picturing the source of sin rather than a substitute to bear sin, as scripture shows. For those with a hazy understanding of God's instructions, the Azazel having sins transferred to it could easily blur into the Azazel being blamed for sin because it was presumed to be inherently sinful like a demon. Now take note of the subtle difference because the same thought pattern prevails today where the principles of God's sacrificial system are not understood. 
It's critical to remember that the Azazel was a substitutionary sacrifice. It took the place of the nation so the people could be spared, having to bear their own sins. The innocent goat became cursed when hands were laid on it, and the sins of the nation were confessed over it, and it was sent away. Its role was to become a symbol of sin and bear the guilt of others, but it did not start out that way. It was a vile and shameful role, and we can rejoice that the Savior chose to become sin and become cursed so that we can enter God's presence. Now, if we allow God's word to interpret itself, the identification falls into place quite readily. But any, any explanation of the azazel that does not allow scripture to interpret itself leaves the interpreter blind to all these witnesses of scripture that the most high God leaves or has provided of his son. On the other hand, the Bible contains no record of sins being laid on Satan or Satan bearing sins, which are the essential roles of the Azazel and the Messiah. Notice also that there is a parallel with what happens during Christ's ministry. When tradition and the opinions of men are held above the word of God, his own people are blinded. Their expectations and their education cause their minds not to see the Messiah, even though, as he said, the scriptures testify of him. The same thing happens today when a foundation is laid using the traditions of carnal men and the opinions of scholars who are influenced by unreliable sources. Jesus Christ is kept out of the picture and instead the great counterfeiter becomes the focus of the most solemn day of the year. Now to summarize, if you begin your study with material other than the word of God, you will probably end up with one conclusion. But if you focus just on what is in God's word and finding witnesses there, you will come to a very different conclusion. That should tell you something. And so the next time that you read or you hear that Azazel is the name of a demon, just ask yourself what the authority is for that. Now the person may not know the source himself, but it certainly is not the Bible. In the next sermon, God willing, we will examine the overall ceremony within Leviticus 16 because there are key features that are often overlooked. And in particular, we will see why two goats were used, why two were necessary. We will see that the first goat being for the Lord, as it says, does not mean what it was assumed to mean. And I'll give you a hint. The phrase for the Lord, as it is used in scripture, does not have anything to do with representation. And finally, we will follow the various beginnings that we considered through to their endings, to the proposed fulfillment, so we can have a complete picture.